Henry VIII was the most notorious and brutal king of England, who would order the executions of his closest friends and even two of his own wives. It's estimated that around 70,000 people lost their heads and were executed in some of the most barbaric ways in history, such as hanging, drawing and quartering. Henry VIII was known for his ruthless side and his violent tempers and rage, but some of his executions showed his true colours and how much of a brute he could really be. This is the most horrific executions of Henry VIII's reign, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. During the reign of Henry VIII, there were many executions which were very brutal. The king executed some of his closest friends and advisers, such as Sir Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell, and some of these are linked to the king's brutal side. He even executed two of his own wives, so was not afraid to order brutal killings to administer justice. But it was at Smithfield which became linked to some of the most savage executions of the time period, as many heretics or religious criminals were burned at the stake. It was there during the reign of Mary I, Henry's bloody daughter, who burned many people at the stake there, but it was also the site of an execution of a man who wasn't guilty of treason, but he was accused of poisoning some of his masters. In England, the fear of poisoning was prominent, especially with the upper classes, and some of the kings and queens even forced servants or employed specific food tasters to sample food and meals before the king and queen would tuck into their food. This was done to prevent poisoning, and as hygiene wasn't great also during the Tudor period, often cases of food poisoning in meals could be linked to deliberate poisoning, so food preparation was in a sense a very dangerous job. It was inside of the Bishop of Rochester, John Fisher's house, that an allegation of poisoning would take place. On the 18th of February 1531, Fisher was in his house having a meal, with a number of his advisers and close attendants. It was said in an act of Parliament what occurred that afternoon, and it was said, on the 18th day of February 1531, one Richard Roos of Rochester, Cook, also called Richard Cook, did cast poison into a vessel, full of yeast or baum, standing in the kitchen of the Bishop of Rochester's palace at Lambert March, by means of which two persons who happened to eat the pottage made from such yeast died. So what happened is that Richard Roos, the cook of Bishop John Fisher, was accused of poisoning yeast, and then two people who ate the food made by the yeast, died. The two people who died were a gentleman named Bennett Kerwin, and also a widower who accepted John Fisher's offer of food inside of his house, and her name was Alice Trippett. However, the more sinister element of a possible poisoning plot put the real target as possibly John Fisher the bishop, as it would not have made any sense for someone to aim to kill those two people. But Fisher did not eat the porridge or the poison soup, and he was unharmed, as it's likely he was fasting during that meal. But more people became ill, and it was said that around 17 of Fisher's company had become violently sick, and many of the diners that evening were those who had been welcomed into his house for charity. With this, Fisher's reputation could have been very damaged, being linked to a plot to possibly poison the poor. But Fisher's brother Richard then immediately went after Richard Roos, and tried to apprehend him and order his arrest but Roos had already escaped from the bishop's palace. As he ran, it's likely this could have been an indicator of guilt, but then Roos was quickly caught and was then imprisoned inside the Tower of London. But the fear of poisoning after this incident went into overdrive and panic. Throughout many upper-class households in London, and also in the royal circles, there was mass hysteria and panic over food being poisoned. This fear even reached the king's royal court, when Roos was interrogated, it was not clear who had given Roos the poison to tarnish the food of John Fisher, but also with this there was suspicion as to whether Roos was linked to a larger plot, with some Protestants planning to kill or assassinate John Fisher. The bishop at the time was considered one of the greatest Catholic scholars in Europe, and he had a great amount of influence in England. This could have brought him into conflict with the king, especially as he would split from the Catholic Church and the Pope and also decree himself the head of the Church of England. Henry VIII did possibly have a motive to carry out the assassination of John Fisher, as he had around this time started to try and find a way out of his marriage with Catherine of Aragon, and he then tried to appeal to the Pope to grant him a divorce so he could marry Anne Boleyn. Bishop John Fisher ultimately would later go to his own execution for refusing to support the King in his marriage to Anne Boleyn, and his position as the supreme head of the Church of England.
but John Fisher was considered one of the biggest problems in getting Henry his divorce or annulment, and Fisher could have gone against the king and supported the Pope. Fisher did do this, and he took Catherine of Aragon's side, and because of this, he crossed the king. But Richard Roots the cook was inside the Tower of London, and was subject to some horrific punishment inside the notorious fortress. Roos was thrown onto the horrific torture device of the rack, and was subject to a huge amount of pain. He was put on the wooden frame, and his arms and limbs were then pulled under incredible strain, and the rack was a successful interrogation machine on Richard Roos. Whilst he was on the rack, he admitted to putting what he believed was simply a laxative into the yeast, and he claimed it was a certain poison or venom, and he then claimed he dropped this in as a joke into the porridge pot. Roos gave over no other names of possible co-conspirators, and he said that he knew that the white powder would cause some ill health or discomfort, but he claimed he did not realise it could be fatal, and he said he only put laxative in the food and nothing more. More suspicion would fall on Henry VIII and the family of his second wife Anne Boleyn, as Eustace Chappie, the imperial ambassador to England for the Holy Roman Emperor, would blame the English king and state he was guilty of organising the suspected poisoning. He claimed that Anne had written documents about how she wanted Fisher to die and how she hated him. But because of his confession in the Tower of London, Richard Roos was never tried and was never brought in front of a jury to defend himself. On the 28th of February 1531, Henry VIII told Parliament of the poisoning plot and Roos was then condemned to die based on what the king had said had happened rather than any concrete evidence. The king's word was final and he also expanded the definition of treason saying that murder by poisoning would be classed as this. He also then tweaked the sentence of death, saying that this crime would be then punishable by boiling alive, and this is exactly what happened to Richard Roos. On the 5th of April 1531, in front of a huge crowd in Smithfield, Richard Roos was taken to his site of execution. He was subject to be boiled alive in a huge pot, and what the crowd saw that day would haunt them terribly. An account from the Tudor period titled The Chronicle of the Grey Friars, said of Richard Roos' horrific death, that he was tied up in chains, and then placed in a metal gibbet frame, before he was then lowered in and out of the boiling water. This occurred three times until he was dead. Another account of Roos' death stated that he roared mightily loud, and divers' women who were big with child did feel sick at the sight of what they saw, and were carried away half dead. Other men and women did not seem frightened by the boiling alive, but would prefer to see the headsman at his work. There were very few executions that were as brutal as the boiling alive, as the blood-curdling screams would be heard all over Smithfield, and Roos was lowered into the boiling pot of water. It's likely that his skin disintegrated also, and the fact it took just three dunks into the pot to kill him showed how brutal the method of execution was. It is interesting to consider whether Henry VIII specifically organised Richard Roos's execution based on the fact he was a cook. There could have been some mocking in this, and that his execution could have been a rerun of his crime of poisoning, as Roos was symbolically the poison which was being lowered into the boiling soup. But it's also interesting to consider whether the king was covering his own tracks, and whether he knew of the poisoning plot. By denying a trial for Roos, it was the king's word that would sentence him to death, and he could have been doing this to cover his own tracks. However, the brutal king Henry VIII would later get his own way with Bishop John Fisher, and sentence him to death, and he and Anne Boleyn would get what they wanted. Fisher was executed for refusing to accept Henry as the head of the church and favouring the Pope in this role. But Fisher would go to his death with dignity, unlike his cook, who was bored alive in horrific fashion. He was a chief minister to King Henry VIII, and was a leader of the Protestant Reformation, who oversaw the dissolution of the monasteries. Cromwell was a key political manipulator, and he and the king got on incredibly well. His rise to power was sharp, but as many who rose too quickly and powerfully during the Tudor period, their downfall was equally barbaric. Cromwell met his end shockingly at the sharp end of the axe on Tower Hill, being executed in brutal fashion in front of a huge crowd. Thomas Cromwell was born around 1485 in Putney, near to the River Thames, west of the city of London. He was the youngest of three children, and his father was a blacksmith and brewer. His father was rather cruel, and he often got into trouble with the law and authorities. In 1503, at the age of 18, Cromwell left England to go to Europe, and he joined the French army as a mercenary soldier, 
but he did not like life in the army. He left and was then employed in Italy, inside of the house of a merchant. But in Florence, Cromwell was influenced by the culture and his master was regularly visited by Renaissance scholars and artists such as Michelangelo. He came back to England around 1512 and he began to establish himself as a merchant in London. Cromwell wasn't happy settling for one job and he also began to practice law. It was his career as a lawyer that would see him become familiar with King Henry VIII. In 1514 he married Elizabeth Williams and the couple had at least three children and lived inside the city of London. They were a thriving family and their marriage was peaceful and settled but tragedy did hit them. Within the space of a year, Cromwell lost his wife and daughters to sickness and he never remarried. He was rising throughout London heavily and he was a successful businessman. Cardinal Wolsey, who was the Chief Minister of Henry VIII at the time, supported Cromwell and together the two became very close. Wolsey was the most powerful man besides a king in England. Cromwell became one of Wolsey's most trusted servants and advisers and he was involved at the time in dissolving smaller religious houses to pay for a new college at Oxford. During this time Cromwell learned the financial strength which could be gained from dissolving monastic buildings and he would do exactly the same for the king. Throughout his time in power Cromwell had a number of enemies at court who strongly disliked him. Henry VIII at the time had tried to get out of his first marriage with Catherine of Aragon. The king's great matter plagued Henry as the Pope would not grant an annulment. This led to Wolsey becoming embroiled in the conflict between the king and the Pope and Wolsey was used to try and obtain a divorce or an annulment. Wolsey regarded Cromwell as his beloved and the pair were very close but while serving Wolsey Henry VIII began to notice Cromwell and the king was impressed with his loyalty and intelligence. Cromwell began to work for the king providing legal expertise with regards to getting the king out of his marriage. Whilst working on this, he became very close to the king and also the queen-to-be, Anne Boleyn. He became a key ally to the couple and he rose to power very quickly. In April 1532, he became the master of the jewels, which were kept at the Tower of London, and he received many other roles. His annual income in today's money was around £4 million, which shows you how wealthy Cromwell really was. He was placed in charge of dissolving the monasteries across England. Henry eventually got what he wanted with the annulment in May 1533 and Anne Boleyn was later crowned in June 1533. Henry broke from the Catholic Church to do this and declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England. This meant it was he who was the head of the Church and not the Pope. In this era of change, Cromwell took on his biggest task, dissolving the monasteries and absorbing their riches into the royal coffers. The monasteries were some of the wealthiest institutions across England and their riches were stolen and sold to fund the king's lifestyle and wars. Thousands of monks and servants found themselves homeless and jobless as Cromwell sent in his group of advisers to close down the monastic buildings. There was outrage about this and opposition in the form of the protests of Pilgrimage of Grace. The North rose up to demand that the change was reverted but this never occurred. From the seizure of land the king became incredibly rich, seizing land, gold, silver and much more wealth. A number of priests and monks who opposed were even thrown into prison and were also executed for their opposition. Those who refused to accept the king's supremacy and Anne Boleyn's queenship were also executed, including the very highly thought of Sir Thomas More. But with Anne Boleyn not being able to provide Henry with a male heir, the king's eye wandered yet again and it was clear that Henry needed a way out of his marriage to Anne Boleyn. Cromwell created an intricate web of lies based on treason, incest and adultery that saw Anne accused of these charges with five other men, including her own brother. Anne was then taken to the Tower of London, placed on trial and later beheaded inside of the tower's walls by a French swordsman on the 19th of May 1536. Cromwell was even there to witness the execution, but following Anne's death, he allied himself with Jane Seymour, but cracks were appearing between him and the king. The changes brought about by Cromwell saw him become a target for his enemies, and following Jane Seymour's death, after giving birth to Edward VI, Cromwell's demise came. After the king had lost his third wife, Cromwell was tasked with finding wife number four for Henry. He proposed one of the Cleves daughters, German princesses, for a match to establish a powerful European alliance. 
Henry dispatched Hans Holbein his painter to create lifelike images of Amalia of Cleves and Anne of Cleves, and when he returned, Henry looking at the images, chose Anne. But when Henry saw her when she came to England in December 1539, Henry was greatly upset. He screamed at Cromwell that she was nothing like the pictures, and their marriage, which had been arranged, was a sham. Henry searched greatly for a way out, but he had to go through with it, but the marriage was not consummated. Henry later annulled his fourth marriage, and was forced to give Anne a significant amount of land and houses, which cost him greatly. But Cromwell's enemies then stuck their claws in. He was made the Earl of Essex, but his enemies were outraged by this, and they spread rumours about Cromwell rebelling against the king. Henry at the time was incredibly paranoid, and ordered the arrest of his chief minister, and Cromwell was accused of heresy and treason. He was held inside the Tower of London, and his enemies humiliated him, and tore off the Order of the Garter. He was declared a traitor, and Cromwell, who was one of the best lawyers in England, was back to find himself a way out. But his enemies avoided a trial, and didn't dare risk putting him on trial. They thought he would be able to get himself off the charges, and they convinced the king to pass a bill of attainder. This outlined the crimes Cromwell was accused of, and he was condemned to die without the need for a trial. There was only one way for him to escape execution, and it was if Henry pardoned him. Whilst being held in the tower, he wrote several times to his former friend, and begged the king for forgiveness, and to spare him. One letter said, written at the tower this Wednesday the last of June, with the heavy heart and trembling hand of your highness's most heavy, most miserable prisoner, and poor slave. Most gracious price, I cry for mercy, mercy, mercy. Henry did nothing, except to commute his death sentence from being hanged, drawn and quartered, to a more straightforward beheading. On the 28th of July 1540, Cromwell was walked the short journey out of the Tower of London to Tower Hill, the site of his execution. He was flanked by guards and the crowds who came to see his downfall. He arrived and climbed the scaffold and spoke out to the huge crowd that had assembled. He said, I am come hither to die, and not to purge myself as some think peradventure that I will. He then stated he had offended God and the king, and he asked for the forgiveness of them both. He then said, I die in the Catholic faith, not doubting in many articles of my faith, nor in any sacrament of the church. When he said this, he did this as humour, as he had caused such damage, destroying parts of the Catholic faith in England forever, with his brutal policies. Cromwell continued to maintain his innocence, and he continued to say, Many have slandered me, and reported that I have been a bearer of such as I have maintained evil opinions, which is untrue, but I confess that like as God by his Holy Spirit doth instruct us in the truth, so the devil is ready to seduce us, and I have been seduced. He then committed his soul to Jesus, calling on his mercy, saying, I see and acknowledge that there is in myself no hope of salvation, but all my confidence, hope and trust is in thy merciful goodness. He then went on to commit his faith, denied aiding any heretics, which protected his family from any further punishment. It's debated what happened next with his execution. Some accounts state how the executioner had a significant amount of difficulty separating his head from his body, but other accounts say Cromwell's head was taken clean off. Those who stated it took more than one blow argue that it took three to take his head off, with the executioner buttering the job. The account of the botched execution states that Cromwell so patiently suffered the strong of the axe by a ragged and butchery miser who very ungodly performed his office. There was rumours that his enemies paid the executioner to do a bad job as they knew it would inflict more suffering to Cromwell. After his beheading, his head was placed on a spike above London Bridge. Following Cromwell's execution, the king greatly regretted everything that happened around the scandal. Cromwell's life and legacy impacted thousands, and it's still felt today. Henry's regret for the execution of his chief minister tells us that the scandal around his marriage to Anne of Cleves was very regretful. But Cromwell today is considered one of the most powerful men in Tudor society. He is a villain in the eyes of many, and a man who it's deemed had the king's back no matter what. Anne Boleyn caused uproar and chaos across England. Henry VIII was becoming very tired and fed up with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and she could not provide him with the son he greatly wished for.
Catherine and Henry's marriage produced only one child that survived, the later Queen Mary I, or Bloody Mary. But Henry was desperate for a male heir, and he began to have his eye caught by Anne Boleyn. Anne arrived at court, and was seen as a captivating young lady, and Henry quickly made advances towards her, despite still being married. Anne rejected him a number of times, and this was incredibly frustrating for him, and Henry was forced to wait until he had sorted out an annulment with Catherine. Both Anne and Henry exchanged gifts, but the king's great matter plagued him, and it was a time where no one could get a divorce, let alone a king. Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, was a proud Catholic European regent, and she believed her marriage with Henry was sacred. Henry tried everything to erase his and Catherine's marriage, as he dreamed of Anne Boleyn. Henry tried to appeal to the Pope for a divorce or an annulment, and he even said he'd sinned by marrying his dead brother's wife. The Pope would not give up, and he banned Henry from marrying again, until the decision came about his first marriage. Cardinal Wolsey was ordered to get a solution, and to get the king his divorce. But Wolsey could not do this, and he also fell from grace, but passed away before he could have been executed. But Henry took action into his own hands, and in 1531, he banished Catherine from court, and took her royal chambers and quarters away, and gifted them to Anne Boleyn. This was seen as disgraceful, and it caused chaos across England, and Anne was almost nearly seized by an angry mob at one point. Henry allowed Anne to perform many of the roles a queen would, even despite not being one, and she was given a peerage which made her very rich, and also benefited her family, with the Boleyns becoming incredibly powerful and wealthy. Anne was the apple of Henry's eye, and she was married to the king in secret on the 14th of November 1532, and it's alleged she then became pregnant after this. There was a second wedding, but then a trial decreed that Henry's marriage to Catherine was in fact a sin and invalid. Five days after, the marriage of Henry and Anne was declared valid, and Catherine of Aragon was stripped of her queenship. Anne Boleyn was crowned Queen Consort on the 1st of June 1533, at a large ceremony at Westminster Abbey. It was clear that Anne was pregnant. There was hope that she would give birth to a son and a new heir to the throne, but following the ceremony, she was paraded throughout the streets, but large amounts of the population disliked her. The Pope excommunicated Henry because of this, and he condemned the marriage of Henry and Anne, and the Pope tried to cause more issues. The King forced all of his advisers and close friends to accept the act of succession, and also that Anne was the rightful Queen, and forced them to turn their back on the Pope. A number of Henry's closest friends and advisers, such as Thomas More, could not accept this, and they paid for this with their lives. It was said that Henry was also the supreme head of the church, and that he had authority on the church within England and not the Pope. This religious turmoil was caused all by Anne Boleyn's marriage with the king, but Anne also began to acknowledge Protestantism, and promoted this within her court. But Anne was then sent to Greenwich Palace to await the birth of her child. There was much hope that this was a son, but a daughter Elizabeth was born, and despite Elizabeth going on to become one of the best queens England has ever had, this was not what the king wanted. This disappointed Henry VIII, but he was prepared to try again for the male heir. Anne was seen as a lavish spender at court, and she had a number of household staff that performed different roles, and even had 60 maids of honour. Her and the king's relationship was happy, and she oversaw court spending large amounts of money on luxuries and decorations. But Henry was obsessed with his desire for a son, and following a miscarriage in 1534, Henry discussed the idea of divorcing Anne Boleyn for the first time. He had spoken to Cranmer and Cromwell about this, but then the idea disappeared for a while. Anne became pregnant yet again, and continued to hope for a son that would get her out of immediate danger but the king began to grow tired of her. As Henry had broken from Rome, he was free to do as he pleased, and this would have made Anne's position rather tenuous and uneasy. It was around this time that Henry began to look towards Jane Seymour, one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting. He gifted Jane a locket with a portrait of them both inside, and Jane wound up Anne by continuing to open and close this whilst in her company. Anne was so angry that she ripped this off Jane, and cut her fingers doing so. But around this time, Henry had a very horrible jousting accident, at a tournament where he was knocked out for two hours, and it's believed that the stress of this, caused Anne to miscarry a baby, 
that many believed was a son. When Henry later recovered, this was the start of the end for Anne and Henry. Henry, driven by the desire for a male heir, was fed up with the miscarriages Anne had, and he said he fell under her witchcraft and spells, and because of this, she was forced out of the royal apartments. Henry then put Thomas Cromwell to task to get him to find a way out of the marriage. Cromwell crafted an expert web of lies and deceit against Anne Boleyn, which saw her being accused of treason, incest and adultery, with a number of other men. Cromwell used all of his experience of Tudor politics to target Anne at court, and he interrogated those on the periphery of Anne's circle, and he managed to get evidence that he believed could bring the Queen's downfall. A number of men were arrested, including her own brother George. All of the men accused were executed in bloody fashion, including her brother, and Anne was indicted on charges and was taken to the Tower of London on the 2nd of May, 1536. When she arrived at the prison, she broke down asking for her father. She was tried along with her brother inside the Tower of London, and all of those accused, including Anne, were sentenced to death. Anne's trial was a sham, and all of the evidence it's believed was false and manufactured. The men accused with her were executed on the 17th of May, 1536 on Tower Hill, but it was said that Anne inside the tower was at peace with her impending death. She could have been burned at the stake, but the king commuted her death sentence to a simpler beheading, fetching a French swordsman to perform the execution, as he believed it would be more reliable. On the day of her execution, the constable of the tower, William Kingston, wrote, This morning she sent for me, that I might be with her at such time as she received the good Lord, to the intent I should hear her speak as touching her innocency, always to be clear. It was said that Anne said, I heard say the executioner was very good, and I have a little neck, and then she put her hands about it laughing heartily. I have seen many men and also women executed, and they have been in great sorry, and to my knowledge, this lady has much joy in death. Before dawn, on the 19th of May, she had called the constable of the tower to hear mass with her, and she prayed she had never been unfaithful to the king. She was given the sacrament, and she was told to ready herself, as the executioner was waiting. She left the royal apartments inside of the tower, and was surrounded by four servants, who followed Kingston to the scaffold at nine o'clock. She was dressed in a red petticoat, and was joined by two female attendants, making her final walk from the Queen's house to the scaffold. It was said that she seemed positive, then she made a short speech on the scaffold. Anne Boleyn was allowed to be executed in private, inside the Tower of London, being spared the eyes of the public on Tower Hill. But there were a large number of people who were there to witness the beheading of the Queen. Anne said to the crowd, Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you. He was an ever good, gentle and sovereign lord. This I take my leave of the world and of all you, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. It was said that her speech had a profound effect on the crowd, and her voice wavered in weakness at times. Anne made a number of people cry, and then her ladies prepared her for her execution. She thanked her women for their service, and told them to pray for her, and the executioner then asked for his forgiveness, and Anne handed him a sack of coins as payment. One of her ladies then placed a blindfold over her eyes, and she knelt and said her final prayers. She seemed dazed as she knelt on her knees in the straw, and she faced the crowd and said, O Christ, receive my spirit. She did look scared, and her women then began to cry at the scenes. Within seconds, a few more prayers were said, and then the executioner unleashed his sword from a lump of hay to gasps in the crowd. In one blow, he struck Queen Anne Boleyn's head clean off, and she lost her life. Her head fell into the straw, and it was covered by a white handkerchief, and cannons along Tower Wharf fired marking the execution of Anne Boleyn. Thomas Cromwell was even there himself to witness the proceedings, and then her head and body were taken by her ladies to dispose of it. They placed her body and head in an arrow chest, and this was then taken inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula for burial. Anne Boleyn's death and execution was incredibly sad, and was manufactured expertly by Thomas Cromwell, 
and it was incredibly shocking. Her downfall was linked with failed pregnancies and the fact she could not produce a son that Henry VIII wanted so badly. But it's ultimately the king's wandering eye that secured her downfall and death. Today she's seen as a tragic second wife of King Henry VIII and a victim of the king's brutal side. Jane Boleyn was born Jane Parker and was the daughter of Henry Parker, the 10th Baron Morley. Through her great-grandmother, Jane was a distant relative of King Henry VIII and the king was her half-second cousin. She was born around 1505 in Norfolk and her family were wealthy and were powerful members of the English upper class. But her father was a man who wanted Jane to become involved in the royal courts and at 14 she joined the household of King Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. She was part of the royal party that attended the Field of the Cloth of Gold summit with the French King. Jane was considered an attractive woman, and she took part in different court masquerades and entertainment. But around 1525, she was married to George Boleyn, the brother of Anne Boleyn, who later became the second queen of Henry VIII. Anne at this time was not romantically linked to the king, but she was a powerful woman at court. When the couple married, the king gave Jane and George a mansion, Grimston Manor in Norfolk, and Jane was then made Viscountess Rochford, following George becoming known as Viscount Rochford. As the Boleyn family grew in their wealth and power, following Anne's coursing of Henry VIII, Jane and George benefited greatly. They were given more palaces, and also were able to furnish these out with huge renovations and luxurious items. They spent huge sums of money on this, however the marriage has been portrayed as an unhappy one. One historian claimed that George was not interested in Jane, that according to George Cavendish, he lived a wild lifestyle. Cavendish said, George ran wild, deflowering women and forced windows, and it's believed he had many extramarital affairs behind his wife's back. But when Anne Boleyn became queen, Jane was now a royal sister-in-law, and she would also become the aunt of Princess Elizabeth, the future Elizabeth I. But it's believed that Anne Boleyn and Jane Boleyn did not get on, and that Jane may have been very jealous of the Queen of England. She would unite with the Queen to banish one of the King's mistresses, but when Henry VIII found out about this he was furious, and he banished Jane Boleyn from court for a number of months. But after being married for 11 years, George Boleyn, Jane's husband, would spectacularly fall from grace. Henry VIII wanted to get rid of his second Queen, however Cromwell implicated George in the affair. Jane's husband was accused of treason, incest and adultery, sleeping and plotting with his sister Anne Boleyn, to bring the death of King Henry VIII. Elizabeth Somerset, the Countess of Worcester, is believed to have given evidence against Anne and her brother, but there was no truth to this. But regardless, George would be sentenced to death and would be executed. There were rumours that Jane Boleyn even testified against her own husband to seek revenge upon him. She was a bitter woman, and there have been suggestions that this was the truth, but it's not categorically confirmed whether she did this or not. Jane's perception in history is that she was a wicked woman who turned against her husband, but recently her reputation has gone through some kind of transformation. It has been written, Jane Rochford found herself dragged into the maelstrom of intrigue, innuendo and speculation, for when Cromwell sent for Jane, he had already much of what he needed, not only to bring down Anne and her circle, but to make possible the king's marriage to Jane Seymour. Faced with such relentless, incessant questions, which she had no choice but to answer, Jane would have searched her memory for every tiny incident that occurred to her. Jane had been not quick to tell tales, but she had buckled under the pressure of relentless questioning, and it was her weakness under interrogation that gave her future detractors, happy to find a scapegoat to exonerate the king from the heinous charge of callously killing his innocent wife, the ammunition to maintain that it was her evidence that had fooled Henry and destroyed George and Anne. George Boleyn was executed on Tower Hill on the 17th of May 1536 in front of a large crowd. He spoke to the crowd and talked about his beliefs, but there were four other men who were executed alongside him. Anne Boleyn was executed two days later inside the Tower of London. It's not known whether Jane witnessed the executions of her husband or sister-in-law, but following the execution the Boleyn family fell from grace. The lands owned by them were given up and Jane Boleyn was absent from court for a number of months. She tried to secure her finances and negotiated with Sir Thomas Boleyn and also with Thomas Cromwell. She was given a decent pension and later she became a lady-in-waiting to Jane Seymour, the king's third wife. 
she was allowed a number of servants and a room inside of the royal palaces, and she also had a number of expensive meals delivered each day. But after Jane Seymour's death, Jane Boleyn was a lady who helped the king testify that his fourth wife Anne of Cleves and the king did not consummate their marriage. With this, the king then married Catherine Howard, his teenage mistress and fifth wife. Because of her help to the king with Anne of Cleves, she became a senior lady-in-waiting to the new queen Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife. But Catherine, it's believed, had been with men before, and at the time this was considered unacceptable for a woman who married the king. But Catherine had gone further. She was allegedly having liaisons with Thomas Culpepper, the king's close friend and favourite courtier, whilst the court was on progress. In different castles, the pair would meet up and these liaisons were facilitated by Jane. Jane was the one who organised the meetings, and Catherine would later be arrested when the information about this came to light, but Jane Boleyn was also arrested too. Inside of the Tower of London, Jane Boleyn was imprisoned, and she was also interrogated heavily by the King's officials. She had a complete nervous breakdown in the Tower, and at the start of 1542 she was declared insane. She would have fits of frenzy, but because of this it meant that the King could not legally allow Jane to be placed on trial for her involvement in facilitating the Queen's adultery. But to allow this to happen, Henry VIII even changed the laws of the country to allow high treason charges to be used against even the insane. But Jane was then sentenced to death for an act of attainder, and her execution date was scheduled for the 13th of February 1542. Inside of the tower, the place of her imprisonment, first Catherine Howard, the king's fifth wife, was executed by an axeman. The blood of the queen was littered all on the scaffold, which had been covered in hay, and shortly after this Jane Boleyn was brought out to her death. Despite being declared insane, Jane was said to have been calm and dignified when she approached the executioner, and one witness said, Their souls must be with God, for they made the most godly and Christian end. The French ambassador said that Jane made a long speech, and she apologised for her many sins. The executioner then asked for Jane's forgiveness, and she knelt on the scaffold and rested her head on the block, before in one swift blow of the axe, she was beheaded. She was buried inside the Tower of London's chapel, close to the remains of her husband. Jane Boleyn's reputation throughout history is one which is rather divisive, as some historians believe she had been treated unfairly throughout the centuries. However, she was a woman who helped the Queen cheat on the King, the dangerous Henry VIII who was responsible for thousands of executions, and he was a man who had a violent and brutal side, and he could turn on his close friends. But Jane lost her head inside the Tower of London, like her sister-in-law and her friend Catherine Howard. Thomas More was born in February 1478, inside of London to a father who was a lawyer. Whilst he was young, he briefly spent time in the household of John Morton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. This stood the young boy in good stead for his future career. Following his schooling, he then attended Oxford University and qualified as a lawyer. More was a pious young man, and he did consider becoming a monk also, but favoured a career in the legal profession. He rose throughout London and worked as one of the under-sheriffs of the city from 1510 to 1518, but in 1514 he had become involved in royal affairs. He was appointed as a master of requests and then also became a member of the Privy Council, which brought him into almost daily contact with Henry VIII and a number of other prominent members of Tudor society. He was part of a delegation sent to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and around 1515 he wrote the history of Richard III. This book documented the life of the notorious king and established Richard as a tyrannical ruler. But in 1516, he wrote his most significant work, Utopia, and this was published in many different countries. He continued to rise throughout the reign of King Henry VIII and was knighted, and then he became the under-treasurer of the Exchequer in 1521. This placed him involved in royal finances, and he also became a secretary and close advisor to the king and his influence over court began to grow. He was seen as a prominent member of court and a reliable one. He was involved in drafting official legislation for the King and also Cardinal Wolsey, as well as welcoming diplomats and visitors to court. His growing reputation led him to become a Member of Parliament for Middlesex, and he also became the Speaker of the House of Commons, and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. In this role he was involved in justice and law in the North, but Moore's greatest role 
saw him become the King's Lord Chancellor in 1529. Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, who formerly held this position, had fallen from grace after he could not gain the King his divorce from his first wife Catherine of Aragon. He later died, but by becoming the Lord Chancellor, Moore was one of the most powerful and significant people in the whole of England. He worked for a number of years closely with the notorious Tudor King, but it was in this position that Moore fell from grace rather sharply. Moore was a staunch and strong Catholic, and also supporter of the Church in Rome. But Henry VIII would split from Rome, and this caused huge problems for Thomas More. He saw the Protestant Reformation, which was taking hold across Europe, as a gross act of heresy, and even began to persecute prominent Protestants within England. He later had to contend with the king's break from Rome, which went against his own beliefs. He banned Protestant texts in the works of Martin Luther from arriving in England and spreading, and he was also involved in investigating Protestants. He investigated book publishers, who could have been printing the books he deemed to be heretical, and anyone who possessed a Lutheran text or translated Bible was arrested. He also opposed William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament into English, and he found it horrifically offensive. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, it was documented that Thomas More was involved in the persecution and torture of many Protestants in England, and that he personally used violence to obtain confessions. One account states that More tied heretics to a tree and whipped them, and that he went further using barbaric torture devices such as a rack. Thomas More also sentenced a number of heretics to death and had them burned at the stake in Smithfield, and he also later admitted using torture on heretics, including children. But although he was known for acts of brutality, today he's considered a saint by many inside of England. As Henry VIII split from Rome, it was clear that More had an issue with accepting the king's supremacy over the church in opposition to the Pope. More supported the Pope over the king, and he refused to accept Henry, and refused to sign a letter in 1530 asking the Pope to annul Henry's marriage to his first wife Catherine of Aragon. Henry VIII made a law stating it was a crime to support the Pope or anyone else's supremacy over the church, and More argued personally with the king over a number of points with regards to religion. In 1531, Henry issued a law that forced all the clergy to support the king's supremacy and role as the supreme head of the Church of England, and More, as expected, refused to accept the oath of supremacy. He went further also and rejected the annulment of Henry and Catherine, and because of this defiance it was clear his career was only going one way. More was forced to resign from his role as Lord Chancellor on the 16th of May 1532, but he did stay at court to advise the king. But his religious views in opposition to the changes, and also Anne Boleyn, caused him to lose his job. He refused to attend the coronation of Anne Boleyn as the Queen of England, and this grossly offended the king and new queen. His refusal to attend was viewed as opposition to the royal pair, and Henry took strong action and charged him with the crime of taking bribes. This was dismissed, but then Thomas Cromwell was put to work, trying to find charges against More. Cromwell accused More of giving advice to the nun of Kent, Elizabeth Barton, who predicted the death of Henry VIII. This was seen as More being implicated in treasonous comments, but on the 13th of April 1534, More was summoned to a meeting regarding the act of succession. He was told to swear his allegiance to it, and accepted Parliament's right to declare Anne the Queen, but he refused to accept the second marriage, questioning the spiritual validity of it, and saying that Henry and Anne's marriage was not viewed in God's eyes as proper. He refused yet again to sign the oath of succession, and he preached to the meeting about the Pope's supremacy over the church, but for more this was enough. He rejected Henry's supremacy over the church yet again, and rejected his second marriage, and for this was sent to the Tower of London to be imprisoned. Whilst he was held at the notorious tower, Cromwell did visit a number of times to try to get him to change his mind, but Thomas More was willing to die for his conscience. He was charged with treason and was tried on the 1st of July 1535. His judges included Anne Boleyn's father, brother and uncle, which meant he stood no chance. He refused to answer a number of questions, but Cromwell had gathered a star witness, Richard Rich, who stated that in his presence, More had denied the king's supremacy as the head of the church. More did question this, but he was found guilty of treason 15 minutes later, 
and was sentenced to death. After his guilty verdict was announced, he said, No temporal man may be the head of spirituality, and stated that the king's act of supremacy went against Magna Carta. But he was sentenced to die, a horrific traitor's death, to be hanged, drawn and quartered. But Henry did allow some concessions, switching his method of execution to a more simpler beheading, which was regarded as less painful. On the 6th of July 1535, Thomas More was brought from the Tower of London to Tower Hill, where he was to face his execution. The crowd that day was huge, and they saw a man who believed he was doing the right thing, going to his death. An account written at the time of his execution tells us what happened. It says, About nine he was brought out of the tower. His hair was long, his face pale and thin, and carrying a red cross in his hand. He often lifted his eyes to heaven. A woman meeting him with a cup of wine, he refused it. Christ at his passion drank no wine, but gall and vinegar, he said. Another woman came crying, and demanded some papers. She said she had left in his hands when he was Lord Chancellor, to whom he said, Good woman, have patience, but for an hour, the king will rid me of the care I have for those papers, and everything else. Another woman followed him, crying. He had done her much wrong when he was Lord Chancellor, to whom he said, I very well remember the cause, and as I were to decide it now, I should make the same decree. When he came to the scaffold it seemed ready to fall, whereupon he said merrily to the lieutenant, Pray sit, see me safe up, and as to my coming down, let me shift for myself. Being about to speak to the people, he was interrupted by the sheriff, and thereupon he only desired the people to pray for him, and bear witness he died in the faith of the Catholic Church, a faithful servant to God and the King. Then kneeling, he repeated the Miserere Psalm with much devotion, and rising up the executioner asked him for forgiveness. He kissed him and said, Pick up thy spirits, man, and be not afraid to do thine office. My neck is very short, take heed, therefore thou strike not awry, for having thine honesty. Laying his head upon the block, he bid the executioner stay, till he put his beard aside, for that had committed no treason. Thus he suffered with much cheerfulness, his head was taken off at one blow, and was placed upon London Bridge, where having continued for some months, and being thrown into the Thames to make room for others, his daughter Margaret brought it, closed it in a leaden box, and kept it for a relic. Thomas More's execution took place on Tower Hill, and the sight shocked the large crowd. His head was taken clean off with one swing of the axe, the executioner doing his job well. After this, his remains were taken into the Tower of London, and were buried inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, with his head then being placed on a pike above London Bridge, to tell people not to mess with the king. But Thomas More's execution on Tower Hill was incredibly shocking, as at the time he gained a huge amount of power during the reign of King Henry VIII. But he went to his death, a man who could not relent upon his own beliefs, and because of his religious convictions, he was executed crossing Henry VIII. He rose to the position of Lord Chancellor, but fell incredibly sharply. Today he's seen as a celebrated scholar of the Tudor period, and as a key Renaissance philosopher and author. One of the most tragic wives of King Henry VIII was Catherine Howard. She was just a teenager when she married the grotesque and large Tudor monarch, who was around 30 years older than her. She was just a young woman, who had been treated terribly by a number of men throughout her short life, and she met a brutal and bloody end. On the 13th of February 1542, she made her way from her apartments in the Tower of London to the scaffold on Tower Hill. There an executioner stood armed with an axe, and in one swift blow, the head of Catherine Howard, the Queen, was taken clean off. She had been implicated in cheating on Henry VIII, and along with two other men, was executed. But one of those men killed for his involvement with her was Thomas Culpepper, one of the closest friends of King Henry VIII. But who is this man that slept with the king's wife? Thomas Culpepper was born in 1514, and was the second son of Alexander Culpepper and his second wife Constance Harper. His older brother would later go on to work for Thomas Cromwell, and his brother was known for being someone who was responsible for collecting valuable items and luxuries for the king and the royal family whilst they were at court. He was related to the Howards at the time, and was a distant cousin of Joyce Culpepper, 
the mother of Catherine Howard, the queen he would later have an affair with. But following the fall of Cardinal Wolsey, and during the reign of Queen Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife, Thomas Culpeper found himself gaining significant amounts of favour at the royal court. He purchased an estate named Hyam Park, near to Canterbury in 1534, and he was then a courtier for Viscount Lyle and his wife, and he was then given a number of gifts, including a hawk, but then he was tasked with helping to get a hawk for King Henry VIII. With this, he was invited to the royal court, and he was seen as a very handsome young man, and was a favourite of the king. It's believed that Culpepper had a significant amount of power over the king, as Henry VIII was close with him. For example, in 1539, he was able to practically ignore a scandal that gripped his family, as he was accused of assaulting the wife of a park keeper, and then murdering a villager. There were murmurs that his brother was the one who actually did this, but following this his elder brother, who was also named Thomas, was then given a knighthood, and then through the king a pardon for this shocking crime was given. This shows that Henry VIII was so fond of Culpepper that he could make any crimes that would carry the death penalty disappear that Culpepper did. Culpepper was then given the title of the Keeper of the Royal Armoury, and he was then made a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber. This gave him even more access to the King, as he would dress and undress him, and he often chatted with the King late into the night, and slept in his bedchamber after they spoke for hours. To reinforce his positive relationship with Henry VIII, the King dispatched Culpepper to go and greet his future fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, when she landed in England, to prepare for the marriage. This marriage did not go well, as Anne shunned the king, and did not realise who he was when she met him, and Henry VIII then spoke out terribly about her looks. But following this, Culpepper was then given Penhurst Palace, and further land by the king. At this time it was clear that the king was very fond of Thomas Culpepper, and the two were very good friends, but as Henry VIII was betrothed to Catherine Howard, a very young girl compared to him, the young Catherine then took a shine to Culpepper. This was in 1540, in the same year that Catherine Howard was made the Queen Consort of England. But things quickly turned, and Catherine saw more in the young Thomas Culpepper than she did the King, her husband, who was now ageing and very unpredictable. With this, Catherine's lady-in-waiting, Lady Rochford Jane Boleyn, then helped to organise illicit meetings between Catherine Howard and Thomas Culpepper. The pair would meet together late into the night, and they would spend lots of time together, it was this affair that caused both of their executions. Culpepper, being so respected and liked by the king, was trusted and had access to the queen's apartments, and he then came in contact with her ladies also. In March 1540, Henry VIII was away on a trip to Dover, and Catherine Howard was then left behind at Greenwich Palace. At this time, Culpepper asked Catherine for a number of favours, and they then met together around this time, and had private meetings and presumably relations in their chambers. Lady Rochford arranged these, and when the Queen was seeing Culpepper, only one of a lady-in-waiting, Catherine Tilney, was ever allowed access to Catherine's room. On the 20th of June 1541, Catherine and the King travelled to York to meet the Scottish King, and they arrived in Lincoln on the 9th of August. It was here where Culpepper met Catherine once again, for a secret meeting in her bedchamber and then this continued on the journey, for example at Pontefract Castle. It was believed a letter was sent from Catherine to Culpepper, in which she wrote how worried she was that he was ill, and she stated, I never long so much for a time as I do to see you and speak with you. The which I trust shall be shortly now, and for a time as I do see and seek with you, and my trust is always in you that you will, as you promised me. With this it's believed that Catherine Howard was genuinely in love with Thomas Culpepper, and it placed him in a strong position. At the time, Henry VIII was hugely overweight and burdened with poor health, and if the king died, then Culpepper would have been a contender to have reigned for the young boy king, Edward VI. He was also very trusted by Henry VIII, and the pair were very good friends, and he even used his position with the king to exert control over Catherine Howard, his wife. She finished her letter with, Yours as long as life endures, showing that she wanted to actually be with him but the news of the affair between the Queen and Culpepper attracted the attention of Archbishop of Canterbury Thomas Cranmer. He heard the rumours, and Culpepper was then held under arrest. The pair denied their affair, but the letter was found, and this was seen as incriminating evidence for it. With this, there was also a reference to Jane Boleyn, and then Henry VIII ordered Culpepper's arrest. In December 1541, 
he was tried for adultery, along with Francis Derham, a man who was accused of adultery with the Queen, before she married the King. Catherine had not made any attempt to really to hide the affair she had with Culpepper, and members of her household then tried to save themselves by actually testifying against her. The Queen was seen as a woman who seduced Culpepper, then a number of these private meetings were discovered. But under torture it's believed that Culpepper then admitted his relationship with the Queen. With this he was sentenced to death, and was initially sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered, which was a brutal method of execution. To escape this he appealed to Henry VIII, and because of his friendship with the King, Henry did spare him being hanged, drawn and quartered, and instead he was beheaded by an axeman. This was seen as a kind thing for Henry to do. He was then taken from his place of imprisonment to Tyburn on the 10th of December 1541. He made his way to the scaffold and there met with the executioner. He was a man considered one of the most disgusting traitors for sleeping with the king's queen. He was quickly beheaded by axe, but then shockingly his head was placed on a spike above London Bridge to act as a strong reminder to the people of London not to cross the king. He enjoyed a much quicker death than Francis Deren did, as he was spared the long ordeal of being hanged, drawn and quartered. It was said that as Catherine Howard was taken to the Tower of London for her imprisonment and execution, that she passed under the head of Thomas Culpepper and her other lover. She was brutally executed by the Axeman in the same manner on the 13th of February 1542, as was Lady Rochford, the woman who it was deemed facilitated their relationship. It was a bloody end for four people embroiled in a scandal centred around sleeping with Henry VIII's wife. John Fisher was born in 1469 in Yorkshire and he was the eldest son of a wealthy merchant. But his father died when he was eight and his mother remarried and had a number of other children. Fisher went on to study at Cambridge University before he was ordained as a priest in 1491 and he had a number of royal supporters. He was backed by Lady Margaret Beaufort, the mother of King Henry VII, and he became her confessor in 1497, and he convinced her to found Christ College and St John's College at Cambridge University. Fisher was close with Margaret, and after her death he became the Chancellor of Cambridge, and also the Bishop of Rochester. He was seen as a perfect and model bishop at the time, and he was very busy with his own diocese. He went to different churches and also visited and cared for people inside of his land of responsibility. He was an active preacher, he was very enthusiastic and he was clearly talented. He was even appointed to preach the funeral oration for King Henry VII and Lady Margaret, but despite Fisher's status within the church, he did come into conflict with one of his former pupils, the new King Henry VIII. Problems arose with regards to the money left by Margaret Beaufort, four colleges at Cambridge, and the king was jealous of this, believing he was entitled to this money. Fisher was a brilliant scholar, and he alluded to being the author of the Royal Treaty Against Martin Luther and the Criticisms of the Church he published in 1521. Henry VIII following this work was then given the title The Defender of the Faith by the Catholic Church, and Fisher preached sermons in cathedrals across the land against Martin Luther and the Reformation. He was staunchly anti-Protestant, and ordered the arrests of reformative priests and preachers. Fisher was prospering greatly in Tudor England, and he was in the king's good books, but following Henry VIII's wish to divorce his first wife Catherine of Aragon, things changed massively for him. Fisher was involved in the theological proceedings against Catherine of Aragon, and the king was desperate to have the support of leading writers and also Fisher. Fisher to begin with backed the king, but he came to the conclusion that the king would divorce Catherine of Aragon in order to marry Anne Boleyn, and therefore he would split from Rome. Being a man of his conscience, Fisher went against the king, and Henry became a target of Fisher's preaching. He was an outspoken critic, and Fisher was a strong supporter of Catherine in the proceedings, and wrote letters to support the Queen, and also published propaganda in support of her. This was incredibly brave, and he believed deeply that the Pope ruled supreme over the Church, and that to reform the Church should be done only by the Pope, and not the monarchy of a country. In 1531, he refused to accept Henry VIII's title as the supreme head of the Church of England, and refused to acknowledge the act of supremacy later on. He also refused to acknowledge Anne Boleyn as the rightful Queen of England, and he later refused to acknowledge the heirs of Anne and Henry as the rightful ones to the throne, 
but because of this, he was imprisoned inside the Tower of London. He was held and imprisoned on the 26th of April 1534, and at this time he was an elderly man, in his mid-sixties, and he was rather ill. There were attempts to get him to submit, and take an oath, but these did not work. Fisher was accused of treason, and things got tougher for him inside the tower, as he was held inside the cold and dark cells within the tower, and he was underfed to get him to give in. He was held inside the Tower of London for over a year, and he was allowed food and drink sent in from friends, and was even allowed a servant, but he was not allowed a personal priest. Fisher was in correspondence with Cromwell about his imprisonment and how harsh things were, but he was caught like a rabbit in the headlights. Richard Rich, a member of court, tried to catch Fisher out, and he asked Fisher for his real opinion, and Fisher admitted that the king was not the supreme head of the Church of England. The Pope was in the process at the time of trying to make Fisher a cardinal, as he believed it would save his life, and Henry was outraged at this. He said that if the cardinal's hat arrived, he would make sure that John Fisher had no head left to wear it. On the 17th of June 1535, Bishop John Fisher was tried in front of a jury, made up of Thomas Cromwell, Thomas Boleyn and ten others. Richard Rich testified, and this was deemed enough to sentence Fisher to death for treason, and he was sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered. But the king then commuted this sentence to beheading in a small act of mercy. Following his condemnation, he said, I think indeed and have always thought, and do now lastly affirm, that his grace cannot justly claim any such supremacy over the church of God. I pray God his grace may remember himself in good time, and hearken to good counsel for the preservation of himself and his realm. Fisher was then transported back to the Tower of London to await his death sentence. But inside of London there was a great outcry of support for John Fisher. People began to draw comparisons between him and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was executed by King Herod for challenging the validity of Herod's marriage. Henry VIII even considered that this could have been a real thing, and he commuted Fisher's beheading to be done before the 23rd of June, which was John the Baptist's feast day. He feared a riot inside the capital on the day of Fisher's execution. On the 22nd of June 1535, Fisher was led from the Tower of London to Tower Hill, which was a short walk away. This was a site where many people were beheaded during the reign of King Henry VIII, and on the short journey and short walk, he prayed the entire time, and when he came to the stairs of the scaffold, he was offered a hand up, but he refused. Fisher then went up the stairs, but as he climbed, the sun shone in his face. It was roughly ten o'clock, and the executioner was ready to perform his bloody job. It was said of that day, the executioner kneeled down to him, as the fashion was, and asked him forgiveness. I forgive thee, said he, with all my heart, and I trust thou shall see me overcome this storm lustily. Then his gown and tippet were taken from him, and he stood in his doublé and hose in front of the people. Whereof here was no such number assembled to see the execution. Fisher was then stripped for his execution, and was incredibly emaciated, which shocked the crowd, and it showed how horrible conditions were that he was kept inside of the tower. He stood on the scaffold and said to the crowd, Christian people, I am come hither to die, for the faith of Christ's holy Catholic Church, and I thank God, hitherto my stomach hath served me well. I beseech Almighty God, of his infinite goodness, to save the king in this realm, and that it may please him to hold his holy hand over it, and send the king a good counsel. It was noted that he seemed positive and spoke with courage, and he was relieved that his imprisonment would not continue. Following this, he fell to his knees and prayed once more, and then the executioner came to Fisher and placed a handkerchief around his eyes. Fisher then lifted his hands and heart to heaven and said some more prayers, and then he laid his head on the little block. The executioner stood there with his sharp and heavy axe. In one swift blow, he cut the head of Bishop John Fisher off, and it was said his neck bled greatly, and there was a huge amount of blood which shocked the crowd. But following his death... Henry VIII treated his remains awfully. His body was stripped and left on the scaffold for hours, until the evening. It was then taken on pikes and thrown naked into a rough grave in a nearby churchyard. Fisher's head was then placed on London Bridge, and it was said it looked lifelike weeks after.
but then it was thrown into the River Thames two weeks later to make way for that of Thomas More's decapitated head. His body was then placed inside the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula at the Tower of London later. Bishop John Fisher died a man of his conscience and a man of great faith. He believed that he was doing the right thing and he supported Catherine of Aragon, which grossly offended the king and his enemy in Henry VIII, who was one who would not hesitate to order his brutal execution. History's most famous and notorious king would order Fisher's brutal execution and because of this, he sent a strong message to those of England. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.